I am tired of being afraid. That has been what this past year of pandemic has, has been about for me. A year of fear. Fear for my vulnerable children. Fear of something invisible. Fear of being around other people, afraid of what you could do to me, of what I could do to you. It is a difficult way to live for a month or two or three, let alone 15. And though the fear is less urgent now, less noticeable in each and every decision I make, it is still there. It lingers in my soul like shadows on the wall at night, their source obscured in the darkness. I don't know that we have done enough to process that fear. I worry there will be lasting consequences of living in that fear for so long. In this week's Torah portion, Shalach Lecha, the Israelites gave in to their fear and the consequences were tremendous. We read the tale of the 12 spies, one leader from each tribe of Israel, who Moses sends to reconnoiter the promised land after two years of wandering in the wilderness. He told them to traverse the entire nation, north to south, east to west, to see what kind of land it was. Was it verdant or rocky? Were the inhabitants strong or weak, few or many? For 40 days they scouted the land and then they returned with their report. They stood in front of Moses and the community and described what they saw. The land did in fact flow with milk and honey. They had plucked a single cluster of grapes so big that it had to be carried on a rod between two men. And they reported that the people in the land were strong and mighty. They looked to them like giants and the spies said they felt like grasshoppers next to them. After they said all this, Caleb and Joshua, two of the spies, could see the effect their words were having on the people. They could see the fear in the Israelites' eyes, so they hushed them and they said, Let us by all means go up. We shall gain possession of the land, for we shall surely succeed. But the other spies only stoked that fear. They said, We cannot conquer the land. We will be devoured. And the community broke into wailing. They said, we wish we had died in slavery instead of coming here to fail to cross into the promised land. Let us go back to Egypt. Only Joshua and Caleb stand their ground. No, they say, we can do this. Twice they say, all tear am, do not fear. But their exhortations do not work and the people are consumed with fear and immobilized. God can see that these people who were traumatized by slavery will never have the faith and fortitude and vision to build a free nation in the promised land. So God decrees that they will all die in the wilderness. Only their children's generation will be allowed to enter into the promised land. Only Joshua and Caleb will be permitted to cross the Jordan once again, the only two who conquered their fear and maintained their faith. The word that Joshua and Caleb used to encourage the Israelites is interesting, tiram, from yirah, fear. There are no less than five words for fear in Hebrew, each with a subtly different meaning. The most obvious choice in this situation might have been the more common pachad, which means terror or trembling. But yirah has a meaning of both fear and awe. The same word is used to tell us to be in awe of God and to be in awe or afraid of our parents. It is the respect of something formidable, something awesome. Fear can be a powerful force and not always a negative one. Fear is what keeps us from leaning too far over the edge of a bridge or touching the hot stove. Fear keeps us from taking unnecessary risks or putting ourselves in danger. And yet fear can also immobilize us. Too much fear can keep us from taking any risks at all. And when we risk nothing, we cannot grow or progress. And so we are left with a conundrum. How much fear is healthy? The line between awe and trembling is razor thin. How do we know when we've gone too far? A car is a dangerous machine capable of killing or maiming its riders or strangers on the street. How do we cultivate enough yira to keep us vigilant, but not so much yira that we refuse to put the key into the ignition? 
In my best moments this year, I have gotten in touch with my fear. I've listened to my fear and learned from it without letting it overwhelm me. Don't get me wrong, there are lots of moments where my fear just overwhelmed me. But there have been a few good days where I have felt able to explore the contours of my fear and where I have learned about myself as a result. I was telling someone recently that I have become less germaphobic in the pandemic. This might surprise you, and it is perhaps a testament to just how germaphobic I was before all this started. But it also, I think, is a sign of how much I've learned about my fear. I learned more about what things are actually going to protect me, like masks and hand washing, and what things are less effective. So now, though I am more aware of the germs around me, I am also less troubled by them. I have learned what in my fear is healthy and what in my fear is not serving me. And for each of us, there is a different calculation. Every person has their own tolerance for fear, their own tipping point when fear becomes immobilization. This year has been most challenging because one of the greatest sources of my fear has been other people. I do not make these calculations by myself. We make them together in a constant negotiation between your fear and mine. As I mentioned, during announcements, an email went out to the congregation, and a print version was mailed today as well, describing the next phase of our reopening. And while it is joyful and exciting, I think it also calls us to have serious conversations about, with ourselves and each other about our fears, the ones that are healthy and the ones that are not. Briefly, once again, we are asking that all congregants and visitors attending Emmanuel events who are eligible to be vaccinated, including those making informal visits to our facilities, get vaccinated. We know the vast majority of you already have. We believe that it is a Jewish value to do all we can to protect our own health and the health of those around us, and we stand with the medical professionals in our community and the ethicists in our movement who have affirmed that vaccines are an effective way to live this value. And trusting that our community will uphold this value means that starting next Friday, we will allow vaccinated individuals who so choose to attend worship and events unmasked. Singing will return to this sanctuary. Communal singing will return to the sanctuary, something that fills your clergy's heart with inc indescribable joy. We know that there are those in our community who cannot get vaccinated. Children under 12, for instance, are not yet eligible to do so. We ask that those individuals continue to wear masks and practice social distancing. And for folks who are not vaccinated for your personal and other safety, we ask that you consider attending meetings events, or worship remotely. To do this safely, we must heed the advice of Joshua and Caleb to live in the tension between fear and faith. We know that some will feel comfortable faster than others. For some, the fear has uh, been gone for months. For others, it lingers on. We know that some will continue to wear masks for a variety of reasons. We must all commit not to judge the pace at which each person moves through that fear. We must be a community that celebrates people, make, people making healthy and responsible choices for themselves and their families, even when those choices look different than the ones we make for ourselves. And we know that many are excited to be a temple in new ways, and we want to celebrate that too. We want all of you to know that however you choose to participate starting next week, online or in person, masked or unmasked, you are a beloved member of this community. And we know that for some, coming back into this space en masse will feel different and strange, perhaps quite difficult even. In the past 15 months, things in this room have changed. And we have changed as well. I encourage you to be patient with yourselves, present with your fears and your longings. The rabbis wondered how the ten spies could get so discouraged by what they saw. In the Talmud, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai speculates that maybe it was a foregone conclusion. They went out expecting to see an unconquerable land, and so as a result, what they found only confirmed those biases. Only Joshua and Caleb were able to enter with an open mind. They saw the, the giant men and the great, giant grapes too. 
but they interpreted those facts differently from the other spies. You who come back in the next few weeks will be our scouts. You will have the opportunity to paint for others a picture of the world we are building. Whether you are eager or anxious, we ask for you to keep an open mind and an open heart. We ask you to be patient. We ask you to be respectful of your fellow worshipers and their journeys. We ask you to help us as we move slowly and deliberately through this process and attempt to continue to build a community where everyone feels safe and a sense of sacred belonging. This reopening is not a light switch. It is a careful process, and you are our partners in executing it. And not only executing it, but maintaining the mindset of flexibility and compassion that has allowed us to navigate this difficult year. In the interest of engaging with our fears, let me share two of mine with you. First, I am afraid for my children. My children are too little to get vaccinated. My daughter will turn four next week, and until two weeks ago, she hadn't been in this building that she loves so much since she was two and a half. She wears her mask diligently, and she has started coming back, and she is ecstatic. And I am ecstatic seeing how ecstatic she is. A synagogue without children is hardly a synagogue at all. And as a parent, the only way I can bring my own children into this place is if I trust that everyone else is following the community's guidelines, that the unmasked people around them have all been fully vaccinated. Trusting in this way does not come naturally after a year of basing my decisions in part out of fear for their health and safety. So I ask your patience and I plead your compliance. We can all do our part to help make this space safe for our children to celebrate their Judaism. But at the same time, I fear you won't come back. I know that many, in many ways participating in Jewish life has gotten easier this past year. I know it can be great to watch services while you cook or tune into a class in your sweatpants or no pants at all. So let me say unequivocally, we need you here. There is a reason that Judaism requires 10 people to pray because we know that the experience of prayer is more transformative for us and for the world when we do it together. Each of you has a unique voice, a unique experience, and without it, our prayers are less rich. If you are on the fence about whether to come, imagine that you will be the 10th person that we cannot pray without you. And if you cannot come in person, please continue to participate online because that adds to the richness of our community too. We will be patient with you as you work through your fear and discomfort, your questions and your challenges, and we hope that you will continue to give yourself to this community in return. We are not complete without you. Seder Eliyahu Rabbah says, I feared in my joy, I rejoiced in my fear, and my love prevailed over all. This is what this new chapter represents. It is a time of fear and joy mixed together, a time of awe and anxiety, but what will bring us together ultimately is love. Love for ourselves when we endeavor to understand our own fears. Love for others when we endeavor to keep them safe. Love for this community as we continue to offer ourselves and show up for each other as we have done throughout this year. It is this love that the ten spies could not imagine. It is this love that was the foundation of Joshua and Caleb's faith. It is this love that will sustain us as a congregation. I look forward to seeing your smiling faces in the weeks and the months to come. Shabbat Shalom.